Welcome to uh, another lecture, lecture 402. This is on acid-base equilibria. And we hear a lot about acids and bases all the time, particularly uh, the changes happening to the environment, of course. Lots of uh, pollutants in the air, like sulfur dioxide, contribute to uh, the acidification of the rainwater. And this has had some consequences on the environment. Uh, we also use antacids at times to uh, help us when we're suffering from pain, when the acid that we regurgitate ends up in our esophagus. We can use ACE tablets, which we call antacids, to neutralize that excess acid. And they, of course, always advertise that certain products are better than others because they can balance the pH for shampoos and deodorants. And as well, we can control our swimming pool chemistry by monitoring the pH and the alkalinity. Um, so exactly what are acids and bases? Well, we first, to uh, explain that, are going to talk about electrolytes. Electrolytes are substances when dissolved in water will conduct electricity. One of the first people to actually describe acids and bases and come up with a theory was a Swedish chemist named Arrhenius, and he suggested that if we have solutions of water, uh, strong electrolytes are substances that exist only in the form of ions. In other words, the molecules or the ionic compounds will break apart and release ions into the solution. And he suggested weak electrolytes only exist partly as ions and mostly as molecules. So if you take a look here, uh, we have some apparatus at the top that shows conductivity. So if we have a non-electrolyte, you can see from the diagram all these particles exist as molecules. The light bulb doesn't come on when the electrodes are placed into a non-electrolyte solution. An example of this would be something like sugar, table sugar, which is sucrose. Sucrose molecules do not ionize in water. The forces between water molecules and sucrose molecules are not sufficient to release charged particles. Now, if we take something like uh, calcium chloride, which is a strong electrolyte, um, what happens when calcium chloride salt is dissolved in water? It breaks apart and forms two plus ions and one minus ions, and it conducts electricity, of course. And then you have a weak electrolyte on the far right, and in a weak electrolyte, something like vinegar, what you're going to get are most of the solution, the vinegar molecules will stay intact, but a few of the vinegar molecules will actually react with water and create ions. So there's a minimum number of ions, a maximum number of molecules, but if there are a few ions in the solution, like in weak electrolytes, then you will get partial conductivity, and you can see the light bulb is partially on here. Now, our Arrhenius defined what acids were in terms of a substance when placed in water increases the hydrogen ion concentration. And an example would be if we take hydrogen chloride gas and dissolve it in water, we end up with hydrogen ions and chloride ions, and the AQs mean dissolved in water. Now, base is a substance that increases the hydroxide concentration. So that if we take a base like sodium hydroxide, which is present in drain cleaners, you end up having, again, the uh, ions of sodium and hydroxide in the crystals of sodium hydroxide will separate from each other and make positive sodium ions and negative hydroxide ions, which can act as an electrolyte, but also acts like a base because of the increase in the hydroxide ion con uh, concentration according to Arrhenius. Now, when you mix acids and bases together, then our Arrhenius suggested that a neutralization happens. So uh, in this case, if we have hydrogen chloride dissolved in water and sodium hydroxide dissolved in water, they will liberate their ions, hydrogen ions and chloride ions, sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And of course, the random collisions of these particles when the hydrogen ions collide with the hydroxide ions, they'll make water molecules. And when the sodium ions and the chloride ions remain uh, in solution, 
we simply describe them as spectator ions. So the overall reaction is there, and then we can show the ionic equation where the ions are liberated. You can see the spectators, sodium and chloride, on the right-hand side. And we can also then use a net ionic equation to simply show which ions are combining to form water. Now, Arrhenius also suggested that all acids must contain hydrogen ions, and all bases must contain hydroxide ions, which, of course, is a flawed idea. Of course, this uh, idea was proposed in the early 1900s. Arrhenius also was one of the first chemists to suggest that carbon dioxide in the air could lead to increased temperatures over time. So he was famous for that. But his flaw was revealed when questioned about how ammonia acts like a base. You can see that ammonia doesn't contain hydroxide ions. So a new idea had to be created to explain ammonia's effect and to explain why it becomes a base. One suggestion, of course, is ammonia can combine with water. And what happens then is when ammonia is combined with water, it makes ammonium hydroxide. And that is how the hydroxide is created. So it's an impact on the actual water molecule itself. And we can see it from this equation here. If ammonium hydroxide in solution, uh, it will liberate ammonium ion and hydroxide ion. So now, there was no experimental evidence, of course, at the time that ammonium hydroxide actually existed in the solution. So again, it uh, had to be rethought. So Bronsted and Lowry, two other chemists, created another explanation to explain what Arrhenius' theory could not. And they created new definitions for acids and bases, one in which acid is regarded simply as a proton donor and a base as a proton acceptor. So let's investigate that. So when we look at, for instance, uh, this is acetic acid. Um, Vinegar is a 5% solution of acetic acid. When it's placed with water, then an equilibrium is established. And this equilibrium is uh, reactant favored, meaning more reactant particles are present at equilibrium than product particles. So only a few out of 100 uh, acetic acid molecules will actually react with water to make hydronium ions and acetate ions. And Again, we can describe the acid by looking at which one donates protons and which one accepts protons. So if you look at the formulas here and you look on right side and left side, you can see that the acetic acid molecule and the acetate ion that's created from it are different by a single hydrogen. And this is because the hydrogen from the acetic acid is being donated to the water molecule. When it's donated, it makes hydronium ion. So because this particle is a proton donor, it will be regarded as an acid. And water in this instance, because it's a proton acceptor, is regarded as a base. Now that's looking at this reaction from left to right. When we look at it from right to left, we can see as well that hydronium ion is donating a proton to the acetate ion. The acetate ion is accepting that proton. And again, because of that exchange, hydronium is regarded as an acid, and acetate ion is regarded as a base. Now, when we look at the actual diagram here to look at the evidence that we have, you can see again that this hydrogen from H from acetic acid, this hydrogen is, is attracted to this lone pair of electrons on oxygen. Remember, oxygen has quite a strong electronegativity compared to hydrogen. So when this hydrogen and this oxygen are sharing this electron pair, the electron pair tends to spend more time towards the oxygen. So that makes this hydrogen vulnerable in some cases. It's slightly positive. And the oxygen part of this relationship is more negative. So if they collide at the right angle with sufficient energy, the hydrogen alone will be transferred, not its electron. Its electron actually stays behind, and you can see that here. The electron pair remains intact. 
one of those electrons actually belonged to that hydrogen atom. And as a result, when the proton itself, the single, um, the hydrogen nucleus, of course, is just a proton, it leaves behind that electron. And so again, you can see that this is the acid because the hydrogen is being donated. This is the base because it's accepting it. And same thing happens on the other side, okay? Except in this case, hydronium is now donating its proton to this electron pair if it collides with, at the right angle with sufficient energy. And again, because of the unequal sharing of the electron pair between hydrogen and oxygen, the hydrogen is vulnerable to being stolen. So again, um, we can just put this in writing here. And again, it just indicates, like I was saying, one is a proton donor, one is a proton acceptor on each side of the equation. Now, we have a term to describe these uh, formulas that are different by a single proton. So this, for instance, HC2H3O2 is acetic acid. It's got a hydrogen. On the other side, it is different only by a single hydrogen. So we call HC2H3O2 and C2H3O2 one minus, we call that a conjugate acid base pair. And when we look, of course, at hydronium and water, we see the same relationship. Hydronium has one extra proton than water. So again, we have a conjugate acid base pair that are different by a single proton. So now again, these formulas are very similar and the difference is just that proton. Now let's consider another reaction. We have ammonia combining with water to make ammonium ion and hydroxide ion. And again, we can see from the diagram that here is ammonia, here is water. We can see again, nitrogen has this pair of electrons that are being unshared. Nitrogen has a fairly high electronegativity. This hydrogen that's being shared with oxygen in a water molecule again, uh, because of the disproportionate force of attraction, the electron pair spends more time around the oxygen than the hydrogen. The hydrogen is vulnerable. If it collides at the right angle with sufficient energy, the hydrogen atom alone will be lost to the NH3 molecule. So in this case, water is donating a hydrogen and forming ammonium ion. And that's why the water is an acid. When we look on the other side, we can see the particle that is different by only a single hydrogen hydroxide is its base partner. So we have a conjugate acid base partnership, water and hydroxide. And again, when we look at it from the right to left reaction, we can see ammonium ion in this case is acting like an acid because it's donating its proton to that hydroxide ion. And now the, the ammonium ion is different by a proton with the NH3 molecule on the left side. And again, here is our second conjugate acid base pairing. So again, hydrogen is being transferred, leaving its electron behind. And here the hydrogen proton is transferred, leaving its electron behind. So you can, you can see that in the illustration. So when the hydrogen is transferred again, you can see this electron pair that's being shared here between hydrogen and oxygen is still there. Only the proton left, its electron was left behind. Same thing happens on the other side. So we have an, a situation here where we have a lone pair of electrons and a hydrogen atom is bonded to it. In that case, we describe that as a coordinate covalent bond. The nitrogen atom is supplying both of those electrons for the hydrogen to be bonded to it. So a little bit of terminology there. And co coordinate covalent bond is what we call it. So this reaction, again, is reactant favored. Uh, not very many of the ammonia molecules actually accept protons, only a few. I have an example here, one in 100. Uh, that's just a rough estimate. Uh, later on, we'll look at the mathematics where you can actually 
determine at 25 degrees Celsius exactly what percentage of ammonia molecules actually accept a proton from water. So now the self ionization of water. Water, of course, can act as both acid and base, dependent on uh, what, it's, what is placed in it. We call substances that can act as both acids and bases amphiprotic. And um, so we look at this example here, and I've color coded it. And hopefully you can see which one is the acid and which one is the base. The blue water molecule, in this case, is losing a hydrogen and becoming hydroxide. Ion. This would be the acid. This is his conjugate base partner. Uh, it's, it's donating a hydrogen. And this particular molecule of water, the red one, is actually accepting the proton. So it's classified as a base. Similarly, on the other side, if we look at hydronium, it's forming water. So it is donating its hydrogen. So here's your base acid conjugate partnership. So, and again, if you look at the actual Lewis structures and diagrams of these molecules, you can see that more clearly. Again, this uh, water molecule on this side, this electron pair, again, is forming a coordinate covalent bond. This hydrogen atom is being transferred and it's leaving its electron behind. Because when you look at what happens, the electron pair is still there. And similarly, on the other side, hydronium ion is donating a proton, it's an acid, and that hydronium ion, that hydrogen, is leaving its electron behind, uh, as we can see over here. So in pure water at 25 degrees Celsius, the concentration of hydronium and the concentration of hydroxide are the same. And that number has been worked out to be one times 10 to the minus seven moles per liter. And we can come up with an equilibrium constant where we, when we multiply the hydronium ion concentration, the hydroxide ion concentration together, it always equals one times 10 to the minus 14 moles squared per liter squared. That's because we have a mole per liter for hydronium and a mole per liter for hydroxide. We get the mole squared per liter squared. And that's temperature dependent. That's at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, something that's important and a source of confusion at times for students is the difference exactly between concentration and molarity and strength so, of an acid. So a concentration is determined by simply the quantity of solute particles in a volume of solution. So we generally measure the quantity of solute in moles. We measure the quantity of solution in liters. So we end up with a concentration in moles per liter. We can use this to describe the concentration of both acids and bases. And the strength of an acid depends on what percentage of the original molecules actually form hydronium ions and hydroxide ions. As we saw earlier, HCl is a strong acid because it completely ionizes, whereas acetic acid is a weak acid because only a small portion of the molecules actually ionize. Most of the original acetic acid molecules remain intact. So if we look here at this example, we have a concentrated, strong base because NaOH, when put in solution, will completely ionize it. Every single particle will separate. Um, that's to be compared with a solution of acetic acid. We have a concentrated, weak acid because, again, most molecules of acetic acid remain intact. Only a small number of them actually split apart and donate hydrogens to water. Uh, we can have a strong dilute acid, which means HCl, again, all the molecules will ionize. And this 0 0.001 mole per liter is, is a fairly dilute solution. And now we can also have a weak uh, base, ammonia is a weak base because not all of them will actually get involved in creating hydroxide ions, only a small portion of them do. And of course, this number indicates that we have a fairly low number of moles in the solution. So hopefully that makes a little bit of a clarification, the difference between strong and weak acids and bases and dilute versus concentrated acids and bases. So the pH function 
is, is really a number that we use just to indicate the level of acidity and basicity of a aqueous solution. And a lot of people refer to the pH as the potential of hydrogen ion or the potency of hydrogen ion in solution. It's a method of compressing an enormous range of hydronium ions using a logarithmic activity scale. And we can come up with a number where the pH is the minus log of the quantity of hydronium ion. And I'm just gonna show you a simulation here. Here we have a solution that's at a pH of seven. We can see the quantity of hydronium ion is one times 10 to the minus seven moles per liter. Quantity of hydroxide is one times 10 to the minus seven moles per liter. Um, those numbers are fairly complicated for the average person to understand. So instead, we've made a simpler scale. That's where the pH scale came from, just to simplify this. So, and we didn't want a negative number. So we simply said, take the logarithm of one times 10 to the minus seven, which is minus seven, and then take the negative value of it. So the negative logarithm of one times 10 to the minus seven is seven. So we have a pH of seven where the quantities of hydroxide and hydronium are equal and the concentrations are there. And you can see the quantity of water molecules here. Now we can also see the count for molecules present in the solution uh, down in the solution itself down here. So watch what happens when I start increasing the acidity of the solution by making the pH go down. So what's happening is you can see these are hydronium particles. You can see their numbers are going up. These are hydroxide particles. Those numbers are going down. And the water molecules are staying constant. So as pH drops, you get more hydronium ions and less hydroxide ions. And when the pH changes by a factor of one, really what's happened is the quantity has gone up by 10. So you can see the concentration of hydronium is one times 10 to the minus six, which is 10 times more concentrated th than one times 10 to the minus seven. So the, it is a logarithmic scale based on factors of 10. Now, when we go the other way, we can see, again, we'll start at seven here. And as we go up, the opposite happens. As we go up, you can now see the quantity of hydroxide ions is increasing. The quantity of hydronium ions is decreasing. The quantity of water is staying the same. And when we go up by a pH, for example, of one unit, you can see the hydroxide ion concentration has increased by a factor of 10. And that's one tenth, of course, the hydronium ion concentration. So that's just a little illustrator for how that pH scale works. And it's based on the logarithmic scale of the base 10. And remember the log to the base 10 of 100 is two. Why? Because 10 times 10 is 100, 10 squared. Give an example of a, a logarithmic scale based on two is the base, two raised to what power gives 16, while two to the power four is 16. So just a little refresher on logarithmic scales. So um, now we can also get an equation from this equation, which is the quantity of hydronium equals 10 to the minus pH. So if we know the pH of a solution is seven, the quantity of hydronium ion will be one times 10 to the minus seven. If it's six, then the quantity of hydronium ion will be one times 10 to the minus six. And of course we can use our calculators to calculate numbers that aren't whole numbers like that. Um, so when we again mentioned that if the pH is below seven, hydronium ions greater than hydroxide. If it's seven exactly, it's neutral, they're equal. And if it's above seven, the quantity of hydroxide is greater than hydronium. So here's a simple um, chart that can illustrate some of the common substances we know. For instance, battery acid actually has a pH of zero. In some cases, it actually is, is in negative territory. Any uh, strong acid with a concentration greater than one mole per liter will actually yield a negative pH value, not shown on the scale. Misconception is that pH stops at zero. It doesn't. It keeps going into the negative range when the strong acid is more than one mole per liter. So stomach lining uh, can create a pH of one in your stomach. Lemon juice, orange juice, black coffee is a five, milk is a six, 
Pure water is a seven, although remember, even pure water has carbon dioxide dissolved in it, which acts like an acid. So pure water usually, it's a misnomer, is not seven, it's usually slightly acidic. And some basic com common substances, eggs are eight, toothpaste nine, an antacid like milk and magnesia, and of course we get into the bleaches and liquid drain cleaners. So other useful equations that can be derived. Yeah. If the potency of hydrogen is minus log of hydronium ion, then the potency of hydroxide is the minus log of hydroxide ion. And again, we can use a pOH to describe a solution as well as a pH. So, and the concentration of hydronium is 10 to the minus pH, which we've seen. Then the con concentration of hydroxide ion would be 10 to the minus pOH. And we have a relationship again, an equilibrium, where a Kw, the ion product of water, is the concentration of hydronium times hydroxide is 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees. And we can also generate an equation that says the pH plus the pOH of a solution is 14. So if we know the solution has a pH of two, its pOH would be, think about it, well, it'd have to be 12, because it has to add up to 14. So it's an easy way to relate pH and pOH. So, where did that equation come from? If you start with uh, the KW equation, you take the log of each term, you end up with uh, the log of hydronium plus the log of hydroxide equals minus 14. And then if you multiply each term by minus one, this becomes 14 minus log, minus log, minus log of KW. And of course now, if we use the terminology that P really means take the minus log of something, so the minus log is pKW. pH is the minus log of hydronium. pOH is the minus log of hydroxide. And that, of course, pH and pOH add up to zero. Again, it's temperature dependent. That's at 25 degrees Celsius. So acids and bases in aqueous solution. Remember, water is a polar molecule, which means because of its shape being angular and its um, electron sharing between oxygen and hydrogen being disproportionate, water is a particularly good solvent for both polar and ionic substances because of this charge attraction. So the, it participates in acid-base reactions as both reactant and solvent. So it can act as a proton donor and as a proton acceptor. And we have an auto-ionization effect here. If you look at this equation, you can see the red water molecule again, is accepting a hydrogen from H2O. So it's a base. This would be your acid. So now if I looked at the water molecule over here uh, and this hydronium ion over here, they're different by a single hydrogen, as are these two different by a single hydrogen. So there's your conjugate acid-base partnerships. The red, one partnership. The blue, another partnership. So, so um, oh, I stand corrected. I'm sorry. So uh, this acid's conjugate base partner is this hydroxide. This base, its conjugate acid partner is on this side. So sorry about that. So the equilibrium expression results in Kw equals hydronium ion concentration times hydroxide ion concentration is one times 10 to the minus 14 moles squared per liter squared at 25 degrees, which we've already talked about. So this is a particularly important page. And you'd be wise to commit it to memory. It's not very difficult to commit it to memory, but there's a lot of useful knowledge that can come out of remembering which are the strong acids. So again, strong acids aren't involved in equilibria. They're one-way reactions that completely dissociate. They react completely. Um, and these are examples of a strong acid, hydrogen chloride gas, which dissolves as hydrogen chloride in the water. And then, of course, every single HCl in the, in the solution of water will actually go to completion and form hydronium and chloride. So you won't find any more hydrogen chloride particles. Uh, anything that's dissolved in the water will actually ionize. Similarly, sodium hydroxide, uh, aqueous, is really a misnomer. It means that this substance does not exist as molecules in solution. It exists completely as sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And the most common strong acids include a list. If you remember your binary acids, you start with hydrogen, hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, 
hydriotic acid, uh, chloric acid, perchloric acid, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid. So there's seven strong acids. Now, any other acid is a weak acid. So if you remember these seven strong acids, you know all the weak acids, and there are literally thousands of weak acids. So similarly with strong bases, we end up with a small group that are strong bases. It's the group one and group two hydroxides. So you end up with sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, uh, calcium, strontium, and barium. And again, you might wonder why isn't lithium part of this package? Well, it's because if you look at a periodic table, lithium, uh, very small ions, the force of attraction between the ions uh, is based on size of ion. The smaller the ion, the stronger the force. So lithium hydroxide, the force is too strong so that not all of the hydroxides are liberated from lithium. Similarly, magnesium and beryllium hydroxide in group two are not strong hydroxides because the force of attraction is too strong. They won't liberate, not all of them will liberate their hydroxides. So here's the list again of seven strong bases. Any other base you know of is a weak base. Those are the strong bases. Those are the strong acids. Spend a little time and commit them to memory. So now I'm gonna show you some problems that are done in acid-base chemistry. So we're gonna find the hydronium ion concentration and pH of a 0.5 mole per liter solution of hydrochloric acid. It's a strong acid, which means it goes to completion. So I can, I can create a table where we have initial values, the change that happens, and the final result. So in this case, we have a 0 0.500 mole per liter solution, three significant digits, and that's the initial quantity of HCl present. And we know uh, the amount of hydronium and chloride is, is negligible to start with. Keep in mind, this initial stage is before any reaction has happened. Now, very quickly, as soon as the HCl comes in contact with water, it is going to decrease. Every single HCl particle is going to undergo this reaction. It's going to go to completion. And of course, for every particle of HCl that undergoes that change, we're going to get an equal number of hydronium and chloride particles in the water. And we're going to have no HCl at the end, and we're going to have equal quantities of hydronium and chloride. Now, can you recall what the formula is for the pH of a substance? Well, pH is the minus log of the concentration of hydronium. We know the concentration of hydronium. So the concentration of hydronium is minus log of 0.5. Recall that this is three significant digits here. That zero doesn't count as a significant digit, just the five zero zero. So uh, we know the pH will be 0 0.301 for a 0.5 mole per liter solution of hydrochloric acid. Now let's compare that to an example done for hydroxide ion. So we're going to look at strontium hydroxide. Strontium hydroxide again is a strong base which means it goes to completion. It's not involved in, a, uh, <clears throat> in an equilibrium. So we have a I, ICF table, and we start with 0.2. And after the strontium hydroxide is introduced into the water, almost immediately it will dissociate and form strontium ions and hydroxide ions. <clears throat> and of course, since it's a strong base, all of it will undergo that change. Now, the difference here is Notice there's two hydroxide ions for every strontium ion because it's a two plus charge and hydroxide's a one minus charge. So the quantity of hydroxide will be double the quantity of strontium. So most common mistake students make is they forget about that stoichiometric relationship. So when this reaction goes to completion, what you're gonna end up with for the strontium and hydroxide concentrations are a two to one ratio of hydroxide to strontium and the amount of strontium hydroxide left is negligible. It's zero, very close to zero. So hydroxide ion concentration we know is 0.4. So how do we get the pH? Well, we can calculate the pOH from the formula. Uh, pOH equals the minus log of the concentration of hydroxide. So the pOH will be minus, will be, sorry, 3.398. Three significant digits again, because up here, the original, the number given was three significant digits. And to get the pH, we know 
the pH added to the pOH equals 14. So when we subtract the pOH from 14, we end up with the pH. So the pH is 13.602. Now I want to notice, uh, mention here importantly, that the whole number part of a pH unit does not count as a significant digit. Only the decimal places count as a significant digit. And that's because it's a logarithmic scale. So again, to explain that, if you consider a number like 2.50 times 10 to the minus 14, you'll note that it only has three significant digits. The minus 14, which is the power, is a placeholder only. It tells you to move the decimal 14 places to the left. That doesn't count as significant digits. That's exactly the same as in a pH or a pOH number. The pH or pOH number does not count as a significant digit, the whole number portion of it. It's the placeholder, all right? So that's my explanation for significant digits and pH units. Please remember that. So now the homework for this particular uh, lecture is listed on the page here. So thanks for uh, tuning in.